You'll hear more about each one of them soon. You do have their biographies in your packages, and you can also view their biographies online. First, our only male seated up here this morning is David Brzezinski, who is the d director for the Project on Emerging Technologies. He is also the director of the Foresight and Governance Project here at the Wilson Center. The Project on Emerging Nanotechnologies was created in partnership with the Pew Charitable Trust in April of 2005, and we are pleased to have with us today, seated immediately to my right, Maureen Burns, the director of the Pew Charitable Trust Health and Human Services Program, which is one of the largest grant-making areas of the trust. And finally, to my far right, is Dr. Jane McCubrey, who is the senior advisor to the Project on Emerging Nanotechnologies and a leading social scientist in the discipline of communication studies. She will present her report in a few minutes. At the conclusion of Jane's remarks, we will have a question and answer session for you to ask questions of Jane or any of our speakers. I'd like to tell you just a bit about the mission of the Woodrow Wilson Center for those of you who are maybe a bit new to the center. We are the living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, established by Congress in 1968. We are a nonpartisan institution engaged in the study of national and world affairs, and we are supported by public and private funds. President Wilson was the only U.S. president to have a Ph.D. He believed that the scholar and the policymaker could learn from one another, and thus our mission here at the center. We try to bring together here at the center the scholars and the policymakers, and as our president says, the thinkers and the doers. To have dialogue, collaboration, research, and study, looking at and presenting pressing issues of the day in national and world affairs. What better place to have a project on emerging nanotechnologies and our discussion this morning. And with that, I will turn the program over to David Rajeski. As I said earlier, his bio is in your handout and on the web, so I won't take up a lot of time telling you about David, but I do want to highlight a few of his career, a few areas of his career. Prior to coming to the center, he was a fellow at Yale University's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and an agency representative from EPA to the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Prior to his work with the White House Council on Environmental Quality, he worked at the White House Office of Science and Technology on a variety of technology and R&D issues. Dave has written extensively on science, technology, and policy issues in areas ranging from genetics to electronic commerce. He recently co-edited the book, Environmentalism and the Technologies of Tomorrow, Shaping the Next Industrial Revolution. And now I'll turn it over to Dave. Well, thank you, Sharon. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you um, to the release of this report. Uh, I think all of us that are involved in nanotechnology uh, are involved because we really see the promises of nanotechnology, both in terms of economic benefits it can provide and also in terms of, of real solutions to problems we're facing in areas of medicine, energy, agriculture. Um, I think that one of the things we have to keep in mind is that in order for the technology to succeed, it depends a lot on the public opening their pocketbooks and embracing a lot of these emerging technologies. And I don't think that's a given anymore. I think one of the lessons that we should have learned uh, from genetically modified food and crops um, is that that is not something that we can assume in terms of consumers. I think consumers today, both in the U.S. and Europe and globally, are both more sophisticated and they're also more suspicious, I think, of new technologies uh, than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. So given that situation, I think it's very, very important for government and industry to really understand how the public is feeling about nanotechnology, both in terms of their expectations about the technology and also potential fears or concerns. This was not an educational project. Jane will talk a little bit about the fact that we really tried to educate the people in these groups. It was basically about listening and discussing with the public. And that's what we did across America in three cities. And we were interested in finding out, I think, three basic things. We wanted to find out first what do people know about nanotechnology and where do they get their information. We think that's critical to being able to craft messages and being able to reach out to people. How are they getting information? And we'll talk a little bit about that. 
One of the things uh, that Jane found out in an earlier study was there was a fairly low amount of trust in the ability of government and industry uh, to manage potential risks around nanotechnology. We wanted to go much further in this study, and we did. We wanted to find out why. Why did people trust or did not trust particular agencies? Was that trust related to government entities? Was it related to specific applications of nanotechnology? And we asked them a question, how do we improve it? So we were very interested in getting information that would be relevant to people in corporations and also in government. And they're interested in improving how consumers feel about or think about nanotechnologies. The last thing we did was we actually floated some policy proposals. There's a number of proposals out there right now uh, in terms of what to do with nanotechnology. One of them involves voluntary agreements between industry uh, and government. And so we asked the public, how do you feel about this? You know, we're trying to put the, the public back in public policy. Um, how do they feel about some of these things that are being talked about in the government? And we'll talk a little bit about what the responses are. I think generally this is a very positive report. Uh, people were excited about the technology. They were still somewhat nervous about our ability to manage the risks, uh, but they had very specific recommendations. And I think that's one of the real surprises of the report on how to do it better. And I think we're going to share those with you in a few minutes. Um, as Sharon mentioned, this is part of a larger set of activities that we're doing in partnership with Pew. Uh, most of those are focused on the idea that we believe that as nanotechnology develops, uh, the environmental and, and human health impacts should be minimized. We think that's very important to the eventual success of the technology. So I'd also like to just turn it over now to, to Maureen Burns from, from Pew and let her say a few words before we start with Jane's presentation. Thanks, Dave. Good morning. Um, as uh, was indicated earlier, I am Maureen Burns. I'm the Director of <coughs> Policy Initiatives. Is that all okay? Silenced at the beginning. Silence. Should I just hold it? It's on. It's on. Okay. It's working okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. I won't repeat who I am, but I am the Director of Policy Initiatives um, and the Health and Human Services Program at the Pew Charitable Trust. It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning and to be with our colleagues from the project on emerging nanotechnologies. This project was created to help the government and private sectors address the potential risks and benefits of nanotechnologies. It's a unique and valued partnership with the Woodrow Wilson Center drawing on the center and Dave and his colleagues' knowledge and leadership skills and the trust's commitment to and investment in initiatives designed to help address a range of emerging technologies. As we have all seen over the years, and Dave alluded to this, the introduction of new technologies can have significant challenges. The trusts in our science and technology policy projects are designed to help scientists, public health experts, businesses, consumer groups, and the government get out ahead of some of these challenges, or at least deal with them on parallel tracks as the technologies move forward. Hopefully this approach will result in helping to protect human and environmental health, facilitate a smoother and predictable path to market for businesses, and enable society to realize the full benefits of these potentially revolutionary technologies. Given our experience over the last six years with science and technology policy programs, and with the input and guidance from experts like Dave Rajewski, the trust see an opportunity to play such a role in the area of nanotechnologies, and we've invested $3 million over the next two years in this project. We're delighted not only with Dave's leadership of the project, but with its distinguished board of advisors as well. It seems to us that it's only fitting that the project's first major educational effort in the field is in public opinion. Throughout the trust work on emerging technologies, we've learned that understanding and respecting public opinion is crucial. How the public responds and reacts to these technologies can help them progress or not. Understanding baseline public knowledge, the facts Americans have, the hopes they hold, and the skepticisms they may harbor is an important role that this project can play. Finally, the trust in all of its work has an ultimate goal, to serve the public interest. As an institution, we realize no benefit from the technology's creation. Our goal, through this project, is to help advance thought and planning about a powerful new engine for progress that can serve the public interest in lasting ways if we attend to the potential risks as well as the benefits of this new technology. 
It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, to be here with Dave, and I very much look forward to Dr. McCoubey's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Jane McCoubey. Jane is a senior advisor to the Project on Emerging Nanotechnology. She was recently an assistant professor for public and interpersonal communications at North Carolina State, and she was a principal investigator in a large National Science Foundation funded study in 2004 that was really one of the first major surveys of public attitudes on nanotechnology. Uh, we really wanted to work with Jane on this because uh, of the first study that NSF did and we felt that this study would really significantly build on the findings of the 2004 study. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane and she can take you through some of the methodology, uh, an overview of the findings, and then we'll open it up for questions. Jane. Thanks. Um, I want to start here with a little context uh, for, uh, because I find many people are not familiar with the field of communication studies. What this is is a discipline that's different from either sociology or psychology. It specifically studies how people communicate, the principles, the regularities, the rules, not the, not the laws, because people are not that simple, but the kinds of uh, practices that are common. A and I use those kinds of principles in analyzing what people say to me uh, in these studies, and I also use those principles in the work I do on public deliberation and best practices of group processes for that. Um, in that context, uh, in 19, I'm sorry, uh, I lost a decade there. In 2004, um, my team did three studies on nanotechnology that involved the public. The first was a major national survey, representative, um, large scale, 1,500 people involved. Um, one of the major things we learned from that, if you consider that people who say they don't know whether they trust government constitutes low trust, then 95% of the American people do not trust either government or industry to manage whatever risk there may be from nanotech. That's a shocking number. It, frankly, I just find that really, really, really shocking, 95%. So as Dave has said before, in this study we wanted to go further. Why is there this much low trust? Uh, and what does it mean for nanotechnology and all the promise that the technology has for products and industry um, and for the American people? Uh, the second piece of context I want you to have here is that this particular study is um, a second of a type designed to find public perceptions when people are informed. We discovered, of course, in the first national survey that people haven't really heard much at all about nanotechnology. <clears throat> in this type of study, we wanted to know how do people react when they are informed. So this is a study of informed public perceptions. It's not a man in the street, um, microphone in the face uh, sort of piece of work. Uh, and finally, um, a lot of measures were taken here to make sure that we did not introduce bias. So I, I would be happy to talk much more about that later, but, but that can wait. I just want you to know that there were many precautions taken here to make sure that the results we find here were not produced somehow or other by the study itself. Um, all right, so what did we find that we think is most significant here? First of all, we found that the American public is very positive about nanotech. The kinds of benefits that may be delivered were welcomed by people. People were even excited about it. Um, instead of being frightened of manipulation of matter at the scale of the nanoscale, um, people were very excited by the kinds of things that were being discovered. Uh, second, we found that when people talked about their concerns, they primarily discussed those concerns in, in the setting of what they knew about technology in the past. Um, and their experiences range, the things they reported to us range from discussion of dioxin and PCBs, um, nuclear waste, nuclear power, lead paint, lead and gasoline, uh, jet fuel contaminated military bases, Agent Orange, uh, what we found here essentially is that people's experience with technology products in which they experienced what they called a history of failed precautions. 
leads them on the one hand to be very interested and very excited about the benefits that nanotechnology may give us, but at the same time to say you're not testing enough. You, if, you, if you can find out in 20 years down the road that a drug like Vioxx causes major health problems, if you can find out that a drug like Viagra causes major health problems, um, you put all these things together and in the public mind there are enough red flags to say that testing is one of the first things that they want. So the history, um, the history of technology and certain types of products particularly influences public opinion on the issue of nanotech. So on the one hand they're positive, on the other hand um, they're very concerned that we don't experience or that we avoid to the degree that we can more problems like drugs that cause strokes, heart attacks, blindness, um, those kinds of issues. Um, that, that their concerns are based on their own personal experience is, I think, incredibly relevant um, to, where, to, to the ways in which um, industry in particular should try to react to the, to the information that's coming out about what the public thinks. Another major piece of this study is the discovery that the concerns about nanotech are linked to very specific types of products and very specific regulatory agencies. In the 2004 study, like this one, uh, of informed perceptions, to our surprise, we discovered that the most controversial application for nanotech was medicine. That is also the area in which the public perceives the greatest potential benefits. So we have an interesting uh, situation here. I wouldn't call it a contradiction. I don't think it's contradictory at all. People want the medical benefits. They see a need. On the other hand, um, their greatest concerns appear to be around the medical uses of nanotechnology. And I, and I think if, if we're listening to what they're saying to us, it goes back again to their experience. What they want are better precautions so that we don't have applications developed that appear to be a solution to a major health problem and then 15 or 20 years down the road or maybe five or eight we find out that they cause as much trouble as they avert or perhaps more. Uh, so we have a convergence of, of um, both concerns and hopes around the same kinds of issues. Um, in terms of the survey data that we did here, we found that after information, after receiving very balanced, uh, maybe even positively written information on nanotechnology and its, and its applications, the regulatory agencies in which trust went down were the FDA, the USDA, and OSHA. And, and I think we can just say health. Uh, around these three agencies, the greatest concern they had was for the health risks and whether or not we had a way to understand the long-term risks. Um, one person's concern comment was essentially to me, as the author of the study and the author of the inf informational materials, you aren't talking about the long-term risks. Why not? Well, if I were able to have that dialogue, I would say, I, I can't because we don't know. But there's, a, a, I think, a, um, a verbatim quote that illustrates where the public's thinking is. What are the long-term risks? Um, their experiences, we need to know what they are. On the other hand, um, they're still very positive. Uh, when we talked about benefits, the most wanted benefits were in the medical area, especially major medical, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, those kinds of major medical concerns. There was also a lot of interest in new consumer products. Make my life easier, one person said. Fix my teeth. Uh, anything along those lines was very, of great interest to people. The third greatest hope for benefit was just simply progress. We need to pro progress as a society. We need to progress as an economy. What they want from us uh, in all of this was also very clear. If you did not have such a clear pattern, you would not be able to draw very clear conclusions. But in this case, the pattern of what people want is very clear. Number one, better testing. 
Uh, you could say more testing. We can, obviously, we can't test everything for 20 years to find out what's going to happen. But I think better testing, more thorough testing, testing in certain kinds of instances at least, or better attention to what the risks probably are. Uh, why does it take us 20 years to find out that we have a major problem with something like hormone replacement therapy? Weren't there some indicators before? If we had to stop that trial two years in because so many people were dying, wasn't there some indication somewhere? Didn't doctors see this? Why? I, I think I'm, I'm speaking with the public voice here. Um, how we do that, of course, is a bigger problem, and, and uh, it, it, it's not my place to try to think about that particularly, but what the public wants from us is better knowledge of the risks, much better information to the public. Um, uh, David Jeske watched the videotapes that we made of all of these groups, and, and one of the things that he has said about watching these that was really striking to me was that as soon as you began to see people getting the information about what was going on, they literally were rocked back in their chairs to find out that this is happening and they knew nothing. That there are 700 products on the market already that are supposedly involved nanotechnology and that has not made the news in the slightest way apparently and that the public had never heard of any of it mostly uh, was really kind of shocking to them. Um, more knowledge of the risks, better information to the public, a public voice. The public wants to be engaged. Government should not be making these decisions alone, is another direct quote from the people in the study. They want to have a say. Um, and I think I know that when we give people information that's balanced and truly informative, and when we engage them in a productive kind of process, they can be involved in a productive way. Um, another piece of what they want, they want mandatory standards. They set a resounding no to purely voluntary industry standards. 11% agreed, only 11% agreed, that meant that voluntary standards would be sufficient. Uh, finally, they really do want the benefits. Um, they also do not support a ban on new nanotechnology project, products, uh, something that's been proposed by some NGOs. Uh, on the one hand, so on the one hand, they are, they are positive, even excited about what the potential is and about the knowledge that's being gained and what may be done productively with it. Uh, they definitely have some concerns, and they definitely think that regulation some kind of regulation is going to be needed in order to manage uh, whatever the potential risks may be. Uh, finally, I think that industry has an enormous opportunity here to get out in front, uh, to join with the public in a problem-solving productive dialogue about how to address these kinds of concerns. It seems to me that if the American public itself has these kinds of strong concerns about certain kinds of products and regulation, industry as a whole should be concerned. That, I think, is the tip of a global iceberg. We live in a global economy. If the people of this country have these kinds of concerns, then industry needs to get engaged in fixing what can be fixed and, um, and trying to resolve what could turn out to be a much bigger problem in the long term. Uh, that's my succinct summary. Uh, there's a lot more. I tend to do uh, very data-rich projects. Uh, I haven't reported everything even in this report that I could. Uh, one, last, one last finding. Um, there is no um, political uh, connection 
to these results. Uh, when I ran the numbers for Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, no significant difference whatsoever. In fact, the only demographic in which there was some difference was race. If you're non-white, you have lower trust in the EPA and Congress. More bad news, I'm sorry. Uh, Congress fared the worst of all the regulatory agencies, by the way. We call them an agency. Congress got the worst grade, so to speak. Okay, thank you, Jane. Let me, I thought what I would do is just, it's, it's watching this tapes, as Jane said, was just an amazing experience for me, um, to be able to sort of watch these people. Um, some of them were retired school teachers, forklift truck operators, uh, making very interesting comments about uh, nanotechnology. But let me just share with you four quotes so you get a, a feel for how they're talking. Uh, this is some, some of their perceptions about the technology and the regulation. The genie is out of the bottle, and I worry about controlling it and not hurting people. We could feed the world, but with money and power in politics, nanotechnology could be very scary. The problem is if these early release products that appear to be benign are suddenly found to be detrimental to human health, we are all going to be hyper-skeptical of industry. They can't regulate what we're doing now because they can't understand it. The regulators don't know. In one small aspect of nanotechnology, there may be only two people who know. This came up again and again. Well, there, there was enough knowledge in the government about what's going on. This is so complex uh, that we really can't understand it. Finally, we need different regulation than we have now. It's a new technology, and we need a different set of people to set up a system to see that it's safe. The current system fails at some points. If a new technology is ex so extensive, we need a new system to regulate it. So I'll give you a feel kind of, of, of what they were actually talking about. Uh, we've got, obviously, some more quotes that we built into the, uh, the report. Um, but it, it was continue, I was continually amazed at kind of the insights people had with just a, a small amount of information uh, and how succinct they were in the recommendations in terms of what does industry need to do, what does government need to do. So why don't we open it up uh, for questions? Why don't you identify yourself so we can yeah. <clears throat> Rolf Rosenkrantz from Inside OSHA. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, I apologize because I have to leave early. Um, one is, um, I'm wondering um, if you found that um, the public wants testing first, uh, what, um, and obviously in nanotech there, there's uh, an unlimited amount of uh, things you can build. What does this say to you about um, how should we handle new products? Um, testing for every new kind of um, particle before it comes out in any new product? I mean, that seems to be kind of a problem. Another thing I wanted to ask is um, if the public wants more information and also participate more, but at the same time they say that um, they trust the agencies more than Congress, um, what does that say to you? What should the agencies, like FDA and OSHA, for instance, take from this? How? What does that say to them? How should they react to this finding? Okay, well, let me just, the issue of kind of what to test. Um, I think the, you know, the, the UK Royal Society report that was put out last year was pretty clear that one of the things that you want to test extensively are dissipative uses. So if we're actually taking particles and, and putting them into the environment, um, that's potentially much more dangerous than something that's embedded in, in a product. Um, and I think Obviously, th that would be a place to start. So we already know that there are actual nanoparticles being used in fuel additives. Uh, they're being used for environmental remediation. I mean, these are all things that I would put on the top of the testing list. Uh, I think the other thing that the, the, the public was asking for was this, this sort of sense of, tell us that it's not going to have long-term effects. And I think if I was in, in industry, what that would mean to me is I would think more about doing life cycle analysis. Because that sends a signal to the public uh, that my, my concern about this product doesn't end when it goes out the door. But I'm concerned how it might be used, how it might be misused, and how it's going to be eventually disposed of. It's not a perfect guarantee, but I think that's one of the things that both industry needs to do and also the government needs to step up and fund a lot more in terms of how do you do these life cycle analysis. It's not clear that a lot of the methodologies we use on existing products are going to work with nano. So I think there's ways for both government and industry to sort of signal uh, that, A, they care about the environment more, 
uh, we're doing a lot of testing of, of human health impacts. We're doing very little testing of environmental and ecosystem impacts. Okay, and that was clearly something they, they were concerned about. Are there going to be not just human health impacts, but also environmental impacts? So I think there's a real need to do more environmental sort of ecosystem testing. Um, so I think that sort of ties to the question of, you know, what do the agencies do? I think when we think about risk, if we think right now about what's happening in New Orleans, we, we have to take away the understanding that this wasn't a technological failure alone, okay? That it was a, it was a failure of both sort of society, organizations, and technology. So the risks around nanotechnology are not just the toxicity risks. That's what we talk about. There's another set of risks that Jane's talking about, which are perceptual risks. And industry faces those and government faces those. And that is how do people perceive the risks? And those are quite often very different, as we found out, from how the toxicologists see the risks. And those risks have a lot to do, those perceptual risks have a lot to do with kind of how we've handled technology as a society in the past. And those get repeated, they get reinforced, they get put into movies, books, video games, television shows. And so they become part of our kind of cultural heritage. Very difficult to change those. The other one are structural risks. And I, I bring this up specifically because you're from OSHA. The way we funded that nanotechnology is we moved millions, billions of dollars now in a very distributed fashion. We've set up dozens of centers, hundreds, thousands of universities around the world. Those are spinning off startup companies. And so right now there's at least 1,200 startups globally dealing with nanotechnology. That's likely to double or triple in the next few years. It is a, a sort of a regulator's nightmare to have to do oversight on a large distributed system of small entities. Okay, If I'm OSHA and I can do oversight on three large industrial actors, that's relatively easy. Or if I'm EPA, if you give me thousands of companies that I have to do oversight on, that's a whole other challenge. And so when we think about the risks around nanotechnology, we have to think about the toxicity. We have to deal with the perception risks that Jane's talking about. And I, th I think we're failing there. I don't think government industry is doing much there. And also, a lot of the regulatory agencies, whether it's EPA, OSHA, FDA, have got to deal with the structure of the industry that's evolving. And that really provides some challenges. You know, how do you get to you know, workers in a small you know, eight or ten person nano startup company? Uh, how much are they going to devote to environmental health and safety? Um, so there's a whole bunch of, of risks. And we think about that, we need to think systemically of the risks and think systemically of how to deal with those. Right now, the discussion tends to be around what's the toxicity of this particle? And that's a valid set of questions. But the system can fail anywhere. It could fail in the sense that the public becomes very, very concerned and starts boycotting products. Uh, it can fail because there's, there's a failure at one, sort of, one small company that we didn't get to. And I think for the government, that means we can't just build websites and assume people are going to come. We need push strategies. We need to get out and essentially get into these companies with the right information. That's, that's presuming that we have the right information. <laughs> and that's a big question about whether you know, OSHA, EPA can actually sort of tell people, this is what you need in terms of safety information. So I think it's important for the government, actually your industry, to think about this holistically, and not just in terms of the toxicity of particles right now. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, I think my, my gut sense would be that, that the public doesn't expect um, industry to test everything forever. But, but to identify where the largest risks may be and make sure you do a good job on those. Uh, I, interesting, I was telling um, someone I know uh, in Olympia, Washington the other day what I had been doing here and that I was coming here to talk about this. And, and he said, well, but, but we already do extensive clinical trials and they take years and they cost millions. Uh, you know, what do they want from us? And, and I, my response was, okay, fine. They take years and they cost millions, but they don't work very well. I mean, I think that's the lesson we should take away from Vioxx and Viagra and Fenfen and, and, and all of these um, pharmaceutical problems that, that we've seen cropping up in the recent history. Certainly there are, there are much older examples, but um, the, the sufficiency of that testing has to be called into question when you can have those kinds of major problems cropping up. I don't want to know that my 60-year-old sister has to stop taking her arthritis med medication because it could cause a bigger problem than the arthritis. I, re I really don't want to hear that personally, and I think that's the, what that's pretty much the public reaction to. Uh, Pat Fibbs from the Bureau of National Affairs. Uh, two very different questions. 
Um, one, in terms of the tests, to what extent were they talking about tests ahead of time and to what extent were they talking about tests and uh, follow-up once products are out there? And also, secondly, I was wondering if you could discuss why there were d these different uh, levels of trust with different agencies and if there are lessons to be learned. Um, all right. Um, they talk about testing separate of tracking, and they talk about both. So on the one hand, they're saying the testing doesn't seem to be sufficient. You should do a better job there. On the other hand, um, tracking also comes up, and it, it has come up in all of the citizen-involved studies that I've been doing over the past five years. It, it isn't just a question of being certain first. It's a question of a certain level of assurance first, and then, uh, because you can't possibly know everything up front, and I think most people are realistic about that, then the next problem then becomes tracking. How do we find problems once we've done our best job uh, of, of making sure that they aren't there to begin with? How do we know uh, when there is a problem? How do we track and monitor? So the public does talk about both of those things and, and ask for both of those things. And the second part of your question What's again? the different agencies? Why is there more trust in like an EPA than an OSHA? And is there something that OSHA can learn from that? Well, I, I think for that, I have to go to the kinds of examples that people gave. When One of the things I've, I did with this study, and, it, and it's uh, near twin, uh, fraternal twin last year, was ask people not only for to tell us the nature of their concerns, if they had any, but also to tell us the reason. And when you look, when you look at those, we found over and over again that people gave us examples from experience. And, and, and um, and a lot of those examples are environmental, and a lot of them are health-related. Um, it, it, it's not a surprise to me that, that FDA and USDA, when you see that the examples are health, that they're related to medicine and they're related um, to uh, things in the environment that cause human health problems, it shouldn't be a surprise to see that the statistics say FDA trust is lower. I think those two things together, the value of, of doing a study that has both of those kinds of information in it, helps you make sense out of the statistic. I think the, I would just add one thing. One of the thing, interesting things that um, came out of the study is that there seemed to be a differential level of trust between civil servants and political appointees. Uh, the people sort of had a, a better feeling about the people in the government. Um, they, they talked about you know, people in the EPA being under-resourced, underfunded, etc. Um, what they were very afraid of was potential political manipulation. Um, and I think that's what really makes them nervous. So I think, I, I would, I think it's important that, that I think generally there was a, a sense of um, the government people, the civil servants are trying to do the best job they can. It's not easy. They're probably under-resourced. Uh, they have to compete with the private sector for talent that was raised by people. And they're clearly cognizant of the fact that it's, it's difficult to compete right now. Um, and I think a lot of their nervousness was the fact that you know, somehow the system could be manipulated uh, politically or by lobbyists or whatnot. That's, so I, I, I really think when we start thinking about the government trust, there was a difference between kind of the political layers and, and kind of the civil servant <coughs> layers also. Yes. Uh, Steve, yeah, I think one uh, I'm Steve Lagerfeld. I'm editor of the Wilson Quarterly uh, here. Um, I'm struck by the by the the, the fact that um, you say, not surprisingly, that there's very low public awareness of this thing we call nanotechnology. Um, and secondly, that nanotechnology actually is a you know very broad. It's hard to even identify it as a single thing. I mean, from a scientific sort of intellectual point of view, it is. Uh, but generally, it's a very broad thing, covers lots of different industries, sectors, and so on and so forth. And as a regulatory phenomenon, the sort of public concern that you're trying to address, uh, in fact, there's not now and never will be a sort of nano-regulator. In fact, it will be broken down functionally so that you, have, you regulate drugs, you regulate uh, uh, industrial processes, electronics, and so on and so forth. Um, so my question is, is it a good thing even to encourage discussion of this thing called nanotechnology? And would it be better to talk about 
this thing called um, nano drug and this thing called you know nano chemical to make my khaki shed stains and so on and so <laughs> forth. Um, <clears throat> Is it, I mean, do you run the risk of, by encouraging this kind of discussion, of creating a monster called nanotechnology, where in fact you have a bunch of very discreet, different, highly unrelated things um, that each presents its own problem? In, in the study, actually, um, there were four different sets of materials that focused on different applications. Uh, and one of the reasons we did that, and also did that in the 2004 uh, Fraternal Twin Study, uh, was to see if there were differences in how people perceive nanotech in different applications. Um, it was the 2004 study that basically said when we showed people the materials on medical applications, there was lower trust. So we are doing um, breaking the information into application-specific kinds of packaging. Um, I, I agree with you, uh, nanotechnology is not one thing, it's not a monolith, it is many things, and it's a good idea to let the, peop to pop to let the public know that it is many things. Um, we did that in the study, we still found that the medical applications were the greatest cause of concern. And I think in terms of one of the interesting responses for the public was when we also gave them very specific information about what the agencies did. Um, the best you can do that. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously getting a soundbite uh, piece of information on what FDA does is difficult. But one of the things that really was interesting was when they saw the number of agencies involved, they got very nervous. They said, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to coordinate? Are these people going to coordinate? How are they going to deal with handoffs? Are things going to fall through the cracks? I mean, they had a, a sense of where organizational failure could take place. And some of them, when we asked them what to do about it, I mean, they came up with this idea of creating a meta-agency, this idea of some, something that would sort of look over all of the agencies. And they, one person used the analogy of the Department of Homeland Security. I'm not sure we want to go there. Um, but there was clearly a sense that there were so many actors in the government that it would be really hard to coordinate these kinds of activities. Uh, they were clearly aware that it was everywhere. I mean, I think that they got a sense at the end that this was a new way of making things. It wasn't the technology and it could be applied almost everywhere. And I think that's why the response, one of the interesting things that they want from, or saw as a benefit was progress. You know, because they saw it as kind of this ubiquitous way of, of kind of restructuring the way we do everything. Um, but they were clearly, as I said, in terms of regulatory issues, they were clearly nervous about who's in charge. And they talked about the need to regulate the regulators. They create some kind of oversight body that was outside of political influence to look at this. So I think there was a sensitivity to the organizational challenges that the government's facing right now uh, in the National Nanotech Initiative. It's how do we bring all these agencies together and how do we get them to work? And if I create this nano product, is it OSHA's job or FDA's job or EPA's job and will it change over time? So they were, I think they were very aware of what, what, what the agencies are facing. It's a real problem. I, I think, uh, just to add, I think your point is well taken. How you inform the public is crucially important. But I think people consistently underestimate their capacity to understand um, complicated uh, systems and science. Yes, you would not want to go into a highly technical uh, level conversation, but I was even struck by Dave's observation of how insightful um, the public is. My experience at the Pew Charitable Trust with a number of the kinds of projects that we support in this area, the public is consistently insightful and has a higher level of ability, I think, to really understand. Um, I thought Dr. McCruby mentioned this well, too to understand how it works and to accept certain um, limitations, but they also have certain expectations about how it is we're going to manage those issues. But it's, a, it's an interesting point. How you do it, I think, is important. Ash, if I could follow up with a question to that. What did your research say about how to communicate information credibly for government and for industry? Uh, well, hmm, let me see. <clears throat> What does my information say about that? I, I think that um, for that, I would go to uh, a British study that I read when I was preparing the first set of, of informational materials for the study in 2004. And this British study is, uh, essentially looked at the way the media had reported um, vaccinations, childhood vaccinations, and the purported link to autism. And essentially what they found was that the British press, by, by focusing on the controversies, instead of 
reporting the evidence. By consistently focusing on the controversies instead of reporting the evidence, the British press had essentially created the perception in the public's mind that there was a link and that the scientists simply disagreed. The evidence, of course, is never, there's been one study that found that link, it was never again replicated. So the link itself has very, very little evidence to support it. Um, what the study suggested to me was that the way I should write the informational materials was simply to do what I would call a lay written review of knowledge. In, in science, you do as um, impassionate and an even-handed uh, survey of what the knowledge is that's out there to inform your own work. Why don't we just do that with the public? Why can't we just simply present the most balanced, informed uh, point of view that we can? And I, I think it's important for journalists to know how critical this is, but, but I think it also should be the backbone of how we give the public information. Um, people can make good, informed decisions when they have balanced information and information on which to make a decision. Your doctor doesn't tell you this scientist says X and the other one says Y. The doctor tries to give you enough information to make your own decision, and that, I think, is what we need to be doing. Um, drawing on the jury literature, and some of my earlier research was on jury deliberation, there's pretty solid evidence there that the public can make, that the public, when they are in juries, can make very solid decisions on scientific-related evidence in trials, that they make about the same decisions as do judges, and as do lawyers, when they are given good information clearly presented. There is a presentation issue, clearly. Hi, I'm Beth Halford. I'm with Chemical and Engineering News. What's to say the public will trust you, though? I mean, you've just told us how you... You've just told us how they don't trust industry and they don't trust certain government organizations. What's to say they'll trust them now? Trust them? Trust Who's I mean, them. You you said, you know, you think this is a chance for industry to really step up and take a forward position here, but you've also just told us that the public doesn't really trust industry. Um, what's to say they'll trust them when they come forward? Uh, the question seems to me to be, does the public have simply a blanket mistrust and will never trust, and there's therefore there's really nothing we can do about it, and I would say no. I would say no to that. Um, public participation processes, situations in which people, industry is trying to actually work together with the public. I, I, I think that people are pretty sophisticated uh, in their understanding of when they can trust someone. When they're being sold, they know it. When their input is going to be used, they can tell that. When they are being given information on both sides, and when their concerns are being addressed, they can tell that. Um, I, I think the trust issue is really about how we do it. Um, it's about how we do it so that people can see that they are not simply trying to be sold a bill of goods. Uh, just an example, there have been a number of studies around the world on public participation processes involving technology in different areas. I'm thinking of one uh, that I read that was in Germany on um, uh, the location of a plant to produce genetically modified insulin. And the public in that locale was very concerned. Uh, and what the study came back and eventually said is that the people running that process blew it because they thought they knew what needed to be talked about. And the public's interest in what to talk about was different, and the public could never penetrate the assumptions of the experts about what needed to be discussed. Now, there, there's a great example of how a, a, a major um, opportunity to build trust was lost. If, if you try to start a dialogue with someone and you won't talk about what they want to talk about, how do you expect them to trust you? I think that one of the things that uh, is quite striking is that um, there's a tendency for the scientific and engineering community to focus on the technological artifact, 
take a look at this particle. It's fascinating. Look what I can do with it. Right? The public has almost no interest in that. What they're focusing on is the institutional context. So they're asking a much broader set of questions. They're saying, who's, who's promoting this? Who's evaluating this? Who's responsible if something goes wrong? Okay. And what happens, I think, with the scientific community is they keep coming out with this fascinating story about, look at what we've done. And it's not asking the questions, sort of not answering the questions that the public wants. They want a much broader set of contextual questions. Yes. So here's what we've done, and oh, by the way, so and so is looking after this, and, and, and this is, we're going to track this. And if something goes wrong, this is what's going to happen. And we're not providing the story that they're interested in. So Jane's right. I mean, basically, there's like two ships passing in the night. Yes. Um, and I think the other issue is, you know, one of the things we found, which I, fa I found fascinating, was a lot of people were getting information on nanotech by word of mouth. I mean, the, the channels are yes. not open. Um, they were getting it from public television and radio. The next one was they were talking to their neighbors. Not surprising. Um, but, you know, that there's, there's, I think, a, mm -hmm. a tremendous mm -hmm. need to figure out how to reach people, how to reach young people who aren't even reading scientific journals. They're tuning into iPodcasts or playing video games. I mean, there's a whole generation that the, the typical press will never reach unless they essentially radically change um, the way they're doing their messaging. It's not that people don't want to hear it. Uh, they're just not going to tune into the channels that people my age use. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think um, we did ask people if they were hearing anything about nanotech, where had they heard it? And if people had very little information, their primary source was public television or public radio. Secondary source, almost as high a percentage, was word of mouth. Someone else told me something. Um, if people were more informed, their primary information was magazines, and their second most uh, prominent source of information was someone else. So we do not have a media-driven story here at this moment. Uh, we have a very slowly spreading, um, more at the neighbor talking to neighbor over the fence or, or co-worker talking to co-worker around the water cooler or, or however it's happening, that word of mouth seems to be the second highest ranked source of information right now in nanotech, frankly, is astonishing to me. Uh, it's, it's amazing, but not terribly surprising in a way, too. A, a lot of the information that people have to work with in their world does not come from the media. It comes from somewhere else. It comes from their life. I was hoping you could speak to what Woodrow Wilson, what this project on emerging nanotechnologies will do with this information. Well, I, I mean, our first commitment is to actually get it out. I think one of the interesting tests will be, well, how will government and industry respond to this? I mean, I think this is a very clear, succinct message from the public. I don't think the public is asking anything unreasonable. Uh, we asked them, do you want to ban technologies? That was not where they were going. Uh, but we asked them, you know, who regulates, and they're clearly not comfortable with industry self-regulating. I mean, those are kind of the bookends, right? So somewhere in the middle uh, is where they're, I think they're going to land, and what, what they asked for is, I think, quite reasonable. It should be part of long-term corporate strategy, and we know nanotechnology companies that are testing proactively and disclosing already. They're a small minority, but they've obviously begun to think about this. Um, and I, I say in terms of the government, there's a lot of things they can do in terms of testing and also in terms of, I think, more disclosure and getting more information out and, and engaging the public, which is not the same as educating them. Um, those, those are not synonymous. So I think one of the interesting tests will be, for us, how will, how will government both here, and we're going to obviously try to get this overseas, it'll be very interesting to see differentially how different countries respond to this information. Um, are, the, are the people in the UK going to do something else with this? Are they going to respond in different ways? Uh, Jane is coming back, what, October 3rd? Yes. And we'll be providing the information to the entire group of the National Nanotech Initiative. Okay. And we also did an upfront briefing. We did a preliminary briefing with a lot of the government agencies in July. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to, you know, so give the government a heads up on this. We'll follow up. And we're obviously interested in seeing you know, how are they going to react and, and sort of interact with this information. Uh, so it'll be an interesting test, I think, to see, you know, what they do. Uh, but I can tell you right now that there are already corporations that have internalized at some level this message. Uh, they realize that there's a need to disclose more. There's a need to actually talk about nanotech. There's a need to do more 
upfront proactive testing, life cycle analyses. They're already doing that. Um, and I think the government will, again, I think my hope is that they'll begin to invest more in, in actual engagement issues. Uh, because one of the, what we ask people, what would you like to see more of? And one of the things they used was the example of what we just did. They said, talk to us. You know, bring us into a room and have a discussion with us. Um, you know, that's not a, a simple thing. There's not a lot of easy methodologies to do that and scale it up. And you're trying to get messages out and have a dialogue nationally. But they clearly wanted not just more information, but they wanted a chance to kind of have input uh, into the process. I, I was striking to me, both in the 2004 study and in this one, um, that by bringing people information, by asking them what they thought, by giving them an opportunity to talk with each other, and then taking that information away to places where people hoped it would be used, um, they perceived themselves not to have been in a study, although they knew that's what we were doing. They perceived what we were doing as, as a way that they, their voice could be heard. Um, they said, when are you going to have another class? Um, do more of this. And it's interesting to me that just that much information and, and engagement and that much of an opening, um, it, 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 was, it was really rather heartwarming to me to sit on the sidelines and watch and have people go out of the room thanking me for conducting research. Uh, was it was an amazing thing. Um, so I, you know, I think they they're with us at this point, and we need to be with them. Did they want? Did, did you discuss labeling? Did they want to know whether the product they were buying had nanomaterials in it? Uh, they did not discuss labeling. Yeah. The the term really never came up. Yeah, I, I think it, it was interesting because we figured that that's kind of what they want. I think they wanted more general background information, you know, what was being invested in, you know, what kind of products might happen. I mean, they were, they were interested in getting this sort of getting the big picture. Um, there was a, there, one group had a debate about, well, what, what if we label? And there's always this issue about, well, someone came back and said, well, nobody reads the labels anyway. You know, there was this big debate in the group about whether well, labeling would happen. Um, I, it was surprising because I thought that they would lock on to labels, but they really didn't. I think what they were asking for was broader contextual information, just what's industry up to, what can we expect? Uh, have we studied it properly? You know, as I say, who's responsible for this? Are we going to track these products? Um, I think, again, it was, it was really broad-based contextual issues. And they, they didn't get hung up in, in specifically in, in asking for labeling. OK, this concludes our program this morning. I'd like to thank all of our speakers. And thank you for coming. Uh, you do have information in your packets. And you can also look on our website and you will continue to see lots of information about uh, the project on emerging nanotechnologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.